on. All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, that was not very Good morning. Well. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to have all of you here. Uh, just some announcements that we want to make you aware of. Uh, today is the deadline for Easter flowers. You need to let Diane know um, today, and payment must accompany, or I was going to say, oh, she can wait on that. No, she's shaking her head. <laughs> okay, no new rules then. <laughs> um, and also, uh, we were collecting those uh, love boxes during February. Uh, they brought in over $300, so thank you so much for your generosity. Um, uh, Flower workers, I already said that. And of course, there's a meeting uh, after church today to uh, talk about the updated, um, updated proposal and to vote on that today. So we hope that all our members can, uh, can stay so we can vote on that. Um, okay, let's... Uh, Take a few moments, listen to uh, our opening song, and uh, yeah, prepare our hearts for worship.
Let's pray. Lord God, we come to give you praise and worship. Lord, you are worthy of that praise, of that worship, and of us giving all of our life to you. You're worthy of our love and honor. Lord, I pray that in this time we would get a renewed sense of who you are and, and a sense of your love for us, a quickening in our hearts of the Holy Spirit that we would draw closer to you and become more like you. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Now, if you'd uh, stand as uh, we have you do a little singing, uh, beginning with Freely, Freely. Sunday, and they found a spot on Thursday, but there's no news about that yet. Please, uh, obviously, continue to pray for Macy and uh, lift up Doris as she continues uh, with, she's got a lot of doctor's appointments and tests and uh, 
continue to pray for her for relief from her back pain. Um, also, Emily told me just before the service, and probably I'm guessing um, maybe none of you know the Sprunger family, J.W. and Debbie Sprunger. Uh, J.W. is uh, the fairly new pastor of the Mennonite, Parksburg Mennonite, and I know that his wife, Debbie, had been uh, ill over the last several weeks or even months, um, and she passed away. So um, I was just... Uh, I'd only met them once, but just very lovely people and um, um, not particularly older people. <laughs> she was, uh, so um, not that that makes it not good, but um, uh, it was kind of a shock to me to hear that she passed. So please do pray for the Sprunger family and, and obviously the folks over at the Mennonite Church. They've just been through so much change, I know, since I've been here. Um, and that, I know that must be difficult. Any other um, uh, requests or concerns or joys that you'd like to share? Anyone, anyone? Yeah. I yeah. know there was some confusion about my nephew, Alan, uh -huh. the one that had the liver failure. Mm -hmm. He is doing wonderful. Oh, that's great. And they believe that the problem was with his diet, but mm -hmm. he's doing wonderful. All right. Um, Joy was concerned there had been some confusion about her nephew Alan we've been praying for. Uh, he had liver failure and um, he's doing great. You hear something like liver failure and you think, thanks, you know, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's doing really well. So, um, and it was a, uh, an issue of his diet. So, yeah, yeah, so, good, anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for um, the privilege it is to come uh, to this place together to worship you, Lord, to share uh, concerns and um, be able to lift them to you, Lord, and we pray for, uh, for all of these folks who, um, we pray for those struggling with illness, we lift up uh, Doris, uh, and uh, Macy, Lord, and it's just so concerning that they have found uh, something else, and I uh, pray that that would not be a serious matter of concern. I pray, oh God, that you would continue to, to pour healing into her and uh, lift up her family and give them strength. Lord, for others uh, within our church who I know are... Um, who are not uh, feeling well and who are struggling with various illness and we pray oh god for them as well lord we lift to you those who are grieving we lift the shemp family to you and uh, and also uh, the sprunger family and the the mennonite church as they um, as they mourn the loss of debbie um, just Give them comfort, Lord. Remind them um, of the hope that they have. Lord, we still grieve when we lose loved ones, but your word says we can don't have to grieve without hope. And uh, I pray that you would give them that, that hope and encouragement. And Lord, we're, we're grateful to hear that Joy's nephew, uh, Alan, is doing so well and pray that he would continue to do so. Help him as he adapts to a uh, different way of uh, living and eating, that he would continue to gain strength. Lord, I pray for, um, even as we will meet after church today, Lord, I have been um, uh, just asking all of us to be seeking your will about um, the expenditure re regarding uh, our technology. Lord, um, I just... Uh, Think of the song that was playing beforehand. Lord, uh, we want your will. We want to see you do your work in your way. And I pray that, that you would just guide all of us, that we might, um, that we might hear your voice and, and follow you. And Lord, I, I just continue to pray for, for our church, that we would, um, that we would be always seeking you and seeking, uh, 
to do your will. Lord, not just when we're gathered together here, but as we go from this place and become the church in the world, God, bless each one. Make us more like Jesus, that we might honor and bless you in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. During Lent, we've been talking about some, uh, some of the spiritual disciplines that help us draw closer to God. Uh, I know some of you have uh, taken a look at least at that uh, wholehearted uh, uh, devotion, little Lenten devotional. That's, I think there's still some Crane Hall. But we've been going through that uh, and some of their themes. We talked about prayer, and we specifically were talking about that acronym ACTS that many of us uh, have used in prayer. We, last week we talked about fasting, something we don't usually talk about very much. The idea that we give up something good in order to intentionally focus more on God. This week we're going to talk about somebody uh, who thought he was giving up lunch, but ended up at an all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> Now that is close to every Baptist heart, isn't it, right? <laughs> if I had ended last week's sermon on fasting with, then you can go to the all-you-can-eat buffet. That's like, yeah, I was under it. Anyway, let's read this familiar story from John chapter 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. And by the way, I, I chose that picture. That's a picture of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. And uh, you can see some of the hills. And I kind of picture them uh, taking off from the Sea of Galilee and walking, walking up those hills. Um, when, Jewish, uh, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. And Jesus then took the loaves, he gave thanks, and distributed those to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. The feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle other than the resurrection that appears in all four Gospels. According to the other accounts, it occurs right after the death of John. Baptist, no doubt leaving Jesus with a deep sense of grief. Large crowds had been following him, and as the chapter opens, Jesus is trying to get a bit of space from them. They've gone to the far side of the lake, and then they literally head for the hills so that he could be alone with his disciples. So they've crossed over, they've hiked up the hills, and I picture Jesus flopping down on some of that grass and heaving a huge sigh of relief as his body starts to relax. And then he lifts his eyes and he sees them. Um, thousands of them. It's hard to imagine thousands, 5,000 people uh, scrambling up the hill to get closer to him. Some were older, infirm, walking with crutches. Others were young, pushing their way past to arrive first. There were mothers and crying babies and whooping children. The hillside must have looked alive, there were so many. 
They wanted healing. They wanted miracles. They wanted help. They wanted him. I think I would have cried. <laughs> but Jesus had compassion. In other versions, the disciples say, Jesus, tell these people to go home. And I admit, I probably would have been the first one in line saying that. And in his human nature, exhausted and grief-stricken, Jesus may well have felt the same way. But he looked at those people, poor and hungry, but striving to come near him. And he had compassion. Sometimes I hear people say, oh, I think the Lord gets sick of hearing from me. But he doesn't. He doesn't. And when you come to him, he looks at you with the same compassion he had for the crowds that day. So Jesus asks Philip, who came from that area, where they could buy bread. When we studied the apostles several years ago, we learned that uh, Philip was a very practical, pragmatic person. Uh, when talking about him, uh, author Daniel, Daniel Hochhalter writes, every time we see Philip in the Gospels, he is on the verge of missing a blessing because of his pragmatism. And so it is here. Now, the little villages in the area were few and far between. That was the biggest problem in getting bread in, the, in any natural way. Um, even in our day, the super, super Walmart wouldn't have enough food on hand to make sandwiches for 5,000 people. But Philip, the pragmatist, thinks first about what? Money money. And knowing they don't have the kind of money that could purchase it, he doesn't think about anything else, like we couldn't purchase it even if we had two semi-tractor trailers full of money, right? We don't have the money, there's no solution, that's it, stop thinking about it. <laughs> and I get that. I, that, is, that is kind of woven into my heart uh, very often. But the text says Jesus was asking Philip to test him. He was giving Philip the opportunity to give an answer that sprang from faith instead of fear. Philip had seen Jesus do miracles. He'd been at the wedding in Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine. Uh, he'd seen the, the healings and, and other, other miracles Jesus had done. Now don't you think maybe, just maybe, if Philip had first thought of those things, he might have said, had, might have had the faith to say, I don't know where we could get bread, Lord, but I know that you have the power to provide it somehow. I'm just, yeah. Remembering how God had been faithful in the past can help us to trust him in the future. Taking a moment to say, wait, am I making my calculations without letting God in the picture? What does the situation look like if I remember God's power and compassion? I gotta tell you, I, I tend to jump like Philip does, but when I can stop myself and say, wait a minute, where's God in your calculation? It does give me a different perspective on things. We're told that Jesus already knew what he was going to do. God always has a plan before we have a clue. Right? What if Philip could have remembered that? And what if the next time we're worried, we say, God has a plan. Not, I hope he does. But I know he does, because he's God. God says plan. That's the voice of faith. Speaking without knowing what the solution is, but having faith that God has one. And then Andrew, who always seems to have a voice of faith, pipes up. Hey Jesus, I've been talking to this guy over here, and he has a couple barley loaves, two little fish, I mean, I know that's not a lot, but he's willing to give them up. 
Now, if that kid had come to Philip, he would have gone, who cares? That's nothing, right? But Andrew says, hey, it's something. What do you think? And the assumption hangs in the air that even this little bit might somehow be of use when Jesus is around. Andrew has, uh, since that series that I did, he has become my favorite apostle. I love Andrew. Every time we hear anything about him, he's bringing somebody to Jesus. And this time, it's somebody who's willing to give up his lunch. We know nothing about this person. It's assumed he was a little boy uh, because of the word that... Um, but I, I looked it up, and the word is used... Not only for a child, but for a teenager, uh, even an adult servant. Um, so we don't, we don't really know much about him. We don't even know how old he is. He's old enough to negotiate with his lunch. Um, the loaves were only about the size of a, of a little pita bread, but five might be more than a, boy would, a little boy would have. So my guess is that he's a teenager, but admittedly, total guess, total speculation. <laughs> And while we don't know his age, what we do know is that he's poor. John specifies the loaves were made of barley. It was the cheapest type of grain, the food of the poor. One writer of the time said it was suited for irrational animals and men in unhappy circumstances. <laughs> so it was animal feed and poor people feed. The two fish are probably um, little dried sardines that were made in a nearby town. His poverty didn't make him unusual. Galilee was a region of peasant farmers who bore the weight of heavy taxes imposed by the Romans who occupied their land. Their precarious situation left them vulnerable to losing their land to the wealthy, intensifying the effects of crushing poverty. We talk about food secure, insecurity in our day, and Probably there was no one or very few in Galilee who wouldn't fit uh, the description of the food insecure. And somehow, this poor, probably hungry young man hands over his entire lunch to Jesus. I wish I'd heard the interchange that made that happen. Um, I wonder if he thought he would get even a bite of the lunch he brought, or if he just offered it all thinking he probably isn't going to get anything in return. And then he sat by, back, and he watched as Jesus said grace and started passing out bread and fish and kept passing and kept passing and kept passing. And every person ate until they were satisfied, is the word that's used. Um, there were probably a lot of those folks who hadn't been able to eat enough to be satisfied for as long as they could remember. But they ate until they were satisfied. It was like Thanksgiving dinner. Whew, I couldn't eat another bite. Little is much when we put it in God's hand. This boy gave what he had, not knowing if he would be taken care of. Talk about faith. We always want guarantees, right? Well, I'll give, but I want to get this out of it. But we don't get them, and that's where faith comes in. In absolute terms, a lunch was a small thing to give. But in the hands of Jesus, it became incredible as he blessed it. Does it make you want to give to see what God would do when you give of yourself? Jesus, here, try this. <laughs> do some of this. And it reminds us, too, that God provides abundantly. He is not stingy, nor does he give grudgingly. Sometimes I get concerned that Christians wanting to be good stewards can become stingy. Pastor and former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, J.D. Greer, made this rather shocking statement. If you are not generous, 
you've never really experienced the gospel. If you feel guilty about how little generosity you show, you don't understand the gospel. I mean, ouch, right? Let's dig in a little. He believes that it is impossible to really experience Jesus and not be radically generous in our response. So if we believe that God has been gracious and generous to us, the natural result is that we become gracious and generous to others. He bases that on three things. First, he says, a major component of what it means to be truly converted is that you realize his kingdom is the most beautiful and lasting reality in the universe. You begin to find your significance in that, not in what you possess. So you don't have to spend lots of money to add beauty and significance to your life. Second, you recognize Jesus, not money, is your security for the future. So you don't have to save extravagant sums of money to feel secure. Third, to be truly safe means you have some sense of how gracious God has been to you. The Bible repeatedly says that the sign that you have tasted God's grace is that you become gracious. Thus, if you have tasted of the gospel, you will be gracious instinctively. I don't know if it's always instinctive. I can remember a period of time when I thought, I'm not that generous. I'm not somebody who goes, yeah, I want to give. But I prayed about that and, and tried to allow these truths to work their way into my life. And I think there's a lot of truth in what he says. To be generous is to trust God. And to trust God is to become generous. And when we trust him, we get to watch him do some amazing things, even with little old us. Imagine what it would be, have been like for that kid or that teenager who gave away his lunch and then seeing it become enough for 5,000 people. That's kind of cool. That would have been <laughs> very cool to watch. And you know, probably not everybody was even aware of that. And there's 5,000 people, somebody hands you bread, it's like, oh, cool. You didn't maybe even, you maybe weren't even aware of this miracle. But he knew exactly what he'd given to Jesus. And he watched it pass, be passed around. Charles Allen was a part of Billy Graham's ministry. He told this story. He said, I was with Billy Graham in the second crusade he ever conducted in Augusta, Georgia. He was just a young fellow. And he said to me, I never dreamed God would give me the ministry he's given me today. And that wasn't the ministry he eventually had, right? This is early on. He goes on, I just said, God, I'm going to give you all I have now, and you lead the way. And that's the way it was. Speaking to a group of pastors, preaching professor Fred Craddock said, we think giving our all to the Lord is like taking a $1,000 bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord, I'm giving it all. But the reality for most of us is that he sends us to the bank and he has us cash in the $1,000 for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here and 50 cents there. Listen to the neighbor kids' troubles instead of saying, get lost. Go to a committee meeting. Give up a cup of water to a shaky old man in a nursing home. Usually, giving our life to Christ isn't glorious. It's done in all those little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. It would be easy to go out in a flash of glory. It's harder to live the Christian life little by little over the long haul. But I think this parable helps us to see what God can do with those quarters when we keep on giving them in his name. Quite a few years ago, there was a Christian song by Ray Bolts. I know a lot of you remember it. just called Thank You. Remember that? He imagines a dream where he and the listener, you or me, 
or in heaven where angels were singing and there's streets of gold and all that stuff. And somebody comes up to you and says, you may not remember me, but um, I was in your Sunday school class. And at the end of class, you'd often invite kids to give their lives to God, and I did. That's why I'm in heaven. And then somebody else says, comes up and says, you know, a missionary came to your church, and, and, and you put some money in the box. You didn't have much. It wasn't much. But you gave it because your heart was touched. And you know what? That's why I'm here now. And the chorus goes, thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I'm so glad you gave. And I got to tell you, I cry every dang time I hear that thing. Because <laughs> I want to hear those words. I want to be sure that I keep volunteering to uh, give my loaves and fish to God. Give the quarters. Give the acts of love. Go out of my way when I'd rather not. Um, to help others. To show them the grace and the love and the generous beauty of God. Little is much when God is in it. There's so many situations that we face in our day, certainly, that are overwhelming to us. But if we give ourselves to following God, and seek to do all the good we can in big and small ways. God can do more than we ask or imagine. Bishop Desmond Tutu said, Do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Let's pray. Lord, it's true that Little is much when we hand it over to you. I pray, oh God, that you would teach each of us to, to follow you with each step, to look for those who could use a word of encouragement or a note or whatever that we can give to them and offer to them as a way to express and to give thanks for how gracious and generous you've been to us. Amen. Amen. Um, we're going to close <coughs> with uh, Freely, Freely, but I changed the word. <laughs> Just because I didn't want you to get too comfortable. No, because I want you to sing it with a little bit of personalization. I have received, I'll give, I'll go, because I believe. So let's stand as we sing. Peace. God bless. Members, please stick around. <laughs>